Okay, welcome to this lecture on MRI of the Basics Chapter 10 for UCSF Biomedical Imaging 201. Um, and here we're going to cover what is titled Image Construction Part 1 and Slice Selection. Okay, so um, this is a very key concept of slice selection that we're going to uh, really explore in this lecture. Um, first, my distraction uh, for today is this. Uh, some of these, some of the most beautiful MRI pictures that you'll see are these uh, flow uh, images and images of the moving heart. Um, and so what you're seeing on the right side here is images in different orientations of the heart captured across the heartbeat. And then on the left, going a step further and actually measuring flow velocities uh, in the heart so we can really look uh, very precisely at the blood flow and it's it's called the 4d flow in that measuring not only the direction of the flow which is three-dimensional an xyz direction plus how uh, strong this flow is as well and that's indicated um and uh so that's color coded uh, in this uh, picture here Okay, but what are we going to, uh, getting serious here, what are we going to learn in this lecture today? We're going to learn how can we only excite, so how can we only excite our uh, net magnetization within a single slice using a RF pulse. And we'll go through some of the more specifics, but we really have the single driving question uh, for this chapter. And so... To start, I just want to set the stage of, of, we often have different types of imaging geometry, what we refer to as a volume, where we're just going to image basically everything that's within the RF coil. Then we're going to have a 3D slab, or we're going to um, use RF pulse to only uh, create some transverse magnetization in some 3D region. We're going to do 3D imaging within that. A uh, topic we'll get more into a little bit later, or uh, 2D sections or 2D slices. We're going to excite a single slice at a time. And uh, we're also going to want to be able to do this in uh, any different image orientation. Our sort of three major ones coronal, axial, sagittal orientations, where we can use our member. Now we have different directions for our magnetic field gradients, X, Y, and Z. And we can apply different ones of these to get these different uh, sort of cardinal slice orientations, uh, or we can even do orientations that are anything in between any sort of oblique, uh, as we call them, so any sort of different angle. So it's great, we wanna do this. How do we only do this so we only excite a single slice um, and the answer is we're going to have two parts to that one we're going to use our magnetic field gradients uh, in this drawing GZ so this is changing frequency uh, or the magnetic field as a function of position and the second part is we're going to use what are called so-called selective RF pulses um, so first touching on the magnetic gradients, I want to explain uh, this picture here. What is being shown here? So uh, in this picture, we have our subject lying here along the Z axis. And we can tell on this axis, so this is a showing the Z component of the magnetic field. We have B0 here, for example, but we can see the magnetic field is changing as a function of position. Um, so that um, tells me that we have a magnetic field gradient on, so our um, 
magnetic field here and z is a main field plus in this case it's as i've drawn it it's a z gradient that's been turned on multiplied by the z position so we get this linear slope we get a change in the magnetic field across our imaging subject okay similar to this example we showed a little bit uh, in the imaging side and the problem that we want to solve here is this region here has been identified in this picture as um, the slice that we would like to excite. Okay, so we have a given region in Z that we'd like to excite. And we can use this intuitive picture, and I'll continue to expand on this later, um, or use a similar version to it to say, well, this problem by putting on the magnetic field gradient becomes not a problem of, of position. But what we would like our do our RF pulse to do um, is to only uh, excite net magnetization that is between these two magnetic field values. So our RF pulse only excites net magnetization at a range of magnetic field or since our resonance frequency is going to be gamma times this magnetic field, or it's equivalent to saying this is it's only going to excite a range of frequencies. And this is what this this picture is trying to help me understand is that when we apply magnetic field gradient represented by this slope here we're doing this mapping where we're mapping a certain position to a certain magnetic uh, and a specific um, unique magnetic field which also corresponds to a unique resonance frequency. And so the problem then of uh, selective excitation or exciting only a single slice becomes a problem of only exciting a given range of frequencies. I wanna take a quick aside to define this term um, called the isocenter. And that's going to be uh, this location right here. And this is the location in the magnet where the gradients are always zero. Um, so in other words, they're never changed in the main magnetic field, for example. And I know it's at this location in this position because it said well, the uh, magnetic field at that location is B not uh, our main field direction, so that means the um, at this location the um, the uh, magnetic field gradients have no effect, and the other uh, this becomes our for example our z equal to zero at this point. This is z, and we use this uh, equation here that. Um, so on the previous slide, I'm going to repeat it here, that when z is equal to zero, 
we're left with just the B0 in the magnetic field. Okay, so this isocenter will come up more as now we're using gradients more and more. So back to what that picture a couple slides ago said. That picture said that we have an ideal RF uh, pulse uh, behavior or pulse profile that we want to create, which is that we want to take a range of frequencies and we want to perform excitation as we know it so far, where we tip the magnetization into the transverse plane or and sometimes to find this in either in the transverse magnetization or the flip angle. I'm going to redraw this over here. We want to create some net flip angle, or we want to create transverse magnetization over a given range of frequencies. And then outside of that range of frequencies, we do not want to create transverse magnetization, or we want to have zero flip angle outside this region. And so these are going to be our ideal call pulse profiles. And we have some region over which we create some transverse stagnation. We have a flip angle and some region we do not. And in fact, any RF pulse we have is selective in this way in some form. But if we don't carefully choose the shape of our RF pulse, we won't get this desired or something close to this ideal behavior uh, that we would like. Okay, and one thing you'll notice, the shape of these functions is something we've introduced very recently, which is the shape of the uh, rect function. So it's kind of a hint, think of what the Fourier transform pair is, and that's gonna start to come up in here as well. So, we have this problem, we want to excite a range of frequencies. And now we know frequencies. This is uh, sounds like a job for Fourier. And, and we just saw a rect function. So let's, well, maybe we're thinking a sync function is going to come into play here. And let's look at well, what is the frequency content of a sync shape. And to do that first, a quick uh, review is that, again, recall if we just applied an RF pulse that really was just a single frequency or a single sinusoid, we would create this um, kind of narrow range here, a flip angle at some given frequency outside this would be zero where this would be the precise way to write that is if we have our, our complex uh, exponential at a given frequency but then this is going to excite uh, our spins only at or very near that given frequency and we want to have a shape here that captures, uh, excites a range of frequencies. And so this is where the sync function comes in. The sync function, as we learned in the previous lecture, actually it does just that. And that's what the Fourier transform tells us is that the frequency content of a sync function is A rect function or um, so that 
the sync function is basically contained this whole range of different frequencies uh, within it. And so a sync function is going to be the primary shape that we're going to see for our RF pulses. Um, note I haven't drawn this to be a perfect rectangular function. Uh, the reason for that is that the sync function is actually truncated in time. A true sync function ripples like this forever and ever. That's not feasible because we don't have infinite time. So we have to truncate this thing, sync function and create some non-ideality where it's not a perfectly flat top here, but it's pretty uh, close. And one more illustration here. Uh, and this is a simulation uh, from uh, MATLAB where I, what's happening here is that adding a larger and larger number of different frequencies together. And you can see that in the frequency profile in the bottom. And the Fourier transform of that, or the shape that we would play for our RF pulse over time, is shown in the top here. And you can see uh, very clearly that this is a uh, sync function. Okay, so putting a few more uh, details and a couple more terms that we're going to see here. Um, we're going to use this concept of the RF pulse excitation profile, where we take our, for example, usually a, typically a sync shaped RF pulse. We can analyze this by the Fourier transform, and that creates our approximate rect shape um, uh, slice profile or excitation profile. We haven't even talked about gradients yet. Uh, or we haven't put, we'll put gradients specifically into this equation a little bit later. Um, there's some, some details here. If you're, if you're interested, we will just, we'll just cover it at this level here. Um, but this is, this is actually not a uh, exact Fourier transform relationship. It's an approximate Fourier transform relationship. Um, due to some nonlinearities of the block equation, there are ways to address those nonlinearities. Um, but for the purposes, certainly, of, of most analyses and intuition, the Fourier transform relationship is uh, sufficient. Now, one other key parameter is shown here is this BWRF, or the pulse uh, bandwidth. And this is uh, really a key uh, parameter of our RF pulse shapes that we're going to use to um, do our calculations of slice thickness, and um, and look at later on uh, some artifacts in the RF pulse. Okay, so we can actually use this relationship that I just talked about that the shape of our RF pulse is that we can take the Fourier transform to see what the pulse profile is or the response uh, of would be of net magnetizations at different frequencies to this RF pulse shape. So here I'm showing this hard RF pulse shape um, that was the initial RF pulse that we introduced in chapter three. Um, but this pulse shape actually turns out to not be a very good idea for slice selective excitation. And the reason is, well, you can begin to see here that this hard RF pulse is basically a rectangle shape in time, or rect shape. So actually the shape we should get over here for our excitation profile is going to be sink shape. And remember what we really want is, is the opposite here. We want a rect shape in our profile and frequency, so we're only exciting our range of frequencies and not exciting outside of that. And so uh, we do not um, typically want uh, this situation. And um, you can visualize the net magnetization vectors uh, see what's going on here. So 
The plot on the left is showing the on resonance case, basically as we'd analyzed it up to this point where we turn on the RF, we get some rotation of the net magnetization into the transverse plane. Um, but this only applies for our, basically our zero frequency here. This is our on resonance. Um, as soon as we create some range of frequencies, we can see um, now that the set of net magnetization vectors in the animation on the right um, gets very uh, spread out. So there are some that are getting the full flip angle. Um, but then what um, you're seeing in this plot is you're seeing that over um, about a range. This is about the range that's being plotted there. <clears throat> that we have, you know, flip angles of our maximum, and in this plot, this is, uh, or in this example, it's a 90 degree maximum, but we're getting everything down to zero degrees. We're getting some magnetization that's actually tipped backwards and some forwards, and just a huge uh, spread. But if we look at this example for a uh, sink shape pulse, now the behavior is not as intuitive as it was when we did when we turned just an RF pulse on and we looked at it rotate. Um, and you can see this in the on resonance case, it's doing a little bit of tipping it back and forth. It kind of over tips it, tips it back. And, and you look in the on resonance case and it doesn't make sense. Well, why would you do that? But uh, turns out it's for this re reason of selective excitation and really for when we have a range of frequencies. And what you notice at the end of this animation is there's a very few compared to the last slide net magnetization vectors in between either those aligned on the Z axis, which are the zero flip, or those aligned uh, in the transverse plane, which are the 90 degree flip. So and this plot is showing some range of uh, frequencies like this. And you can see that, you know, we really have uh, some uh, net magnetizations here where uh, there's basically no transverse magnetization. And then this nice uh, region in the middle where we get a bunch of a good 90 degree excitation. There's there's a few um, uh, net magnetizations in these in these intermediate what we call the transition regions, um, but not nearly as many as there were in the hard pulse case. And we could even uh, if we desired take this example of how we use the Fourier transform to determine this relationship between our RF pulse profile and our RF pulse shape. We could take some arbitrary shape of what flip angle we want as a function of frequency, which we're gonna later turn this into frequency into position. And we could simply take, well, let's, we would take, and I don't have a, drawing for this, but we could take the inverse Fourier transform of you know, this shape here and derive uh, what kind of RF pulse we're gonna use. So um, we can use now some of the Fourier transform relationships uh, to, to analyze what's gonna happen with the RF pulse. <clears throat> this is uh, an example from the textbook where um, they're illustrating here this Fourier transform relationship pair where if we scale a function, When we look at the Fourier transform, 
of that function, which you usually denote with a capital F, that it's going to be scaled in the opposite direction. And the notation here, just to back up a stack, is that little f, we take the Fourier transform of that, we get big F in the dual domain. In this case, we're going between time and frequency. <clears throat> so what happens because of this Fourier transform relationship is that as, as we um, We squeeze our um, RF uh, waveform in the um, time domain. Then we end up getting a stretching. Um, there we go. We're going to get a stretching of our pulse profile in the frequency domain. So that's coming from this term here. Here's our shrink or stretch in time. And then this picture is also nicely drawn in that there's actually also a change in the amplitude here. That comes from this term in this Fourier transform pair. And so here's an example where we're completely using the Fourier transform to uh, analyze the different effects of uh, on RF pulses um, and change how manipulating them can manipulate our RF pulse profiles. Another thing um, I want to briefly visit here. Uh, is how do we calculate the RF pulse flip angle? Um, to look at this, uh, sometimes they use the notation of B1 of T of describing the RF pulse uh, shape and units of magnetic field. And if we look at this flip angle value here, the center of the pulse profile, this flip angle is going to be equal to gamma times the integral of the RF pulse shape over time. And you can derive from this relationship that it actually converges to the previous relationship that we derived for our hard uh, RF pulse as well. Um, and for completeness here, listing a bunch of the other parameters that you may have associated with a RF pulse. You might have a, we talked about the, the, the pulse shape and magnetic field. We're going to have a peak amplitude there. It's actually going to have a shape that's these discreetly sampled values. Um, a couple parameters in the profile is the talk, we're going to use the bandwidth a lot. But we also have these ripple parameters and a couple of other things we consider could consider the pulse power is important for this SAR uh, as you've seen in the homework and and sometimes there are pulses are characterized by uh, this time, thing called the time bandwidth product which is the multiplication of the pulse duration times the bandwidth and it turns out this is um, this is actually fixed uh, for a given shape. So it's going to be a useful way to um, characterize an RF pulse shape. Okay, the next thing we'd like to do is go from this looking at our RF pulse and the profile creates as a function of frequency. We want to convert this to a spatial profile. Remember, 
we ultimately want to create a slice selection. And so instead of exciting, uh, we are going to start thinking of things in terms of not just the pulse bandwidth, but the slice thickness. And the way that we're going to accomplish this is during our RF pulse, this time where we're turning on our RF field, we're going to also coincidentally turn on a magnetic field gradient here shown as the GZ uh, axis. And that is going to have the effect of now exciting some limited slice, in this case in the Z dimension, with some thickness. And we're still going to be able to use this uh, Fourier transform relationship to describe this. So I'm going to show a picture here that I think is helpful for gaining intuition about how this works. So here's a picture where we've been turned on a magnetic field gradient, in this case GZ. So we do have what we do is we create this relationship between magnetic field or frequency and a function as a function of uh, position. And so we come in and turn on our RF pulse during this magnetic field gradient. What we know from the first half of this lecture is that like the sink shaped RF pulse, for example, creates a frequency selective profile that looks like this, where it has some bandwidth, delta omega here, over which creates some net fling flip angle or transverse magnetization. And what the gradient does is it converts that range of frequency into a range of position. And it's only going to excite or create a flip angle in the same way that the RF pulse was only creating flip angle over a range of frequencies. It's only going to create flip angle over a range of uh, slice uh, or spatial locations. And now here, delta Z, this is our slice thickness. And um, actually, you can derive based on uh, this picture, this relationship for the between the RF pulse bandwidth and the slice thickness. OK, so we can use this picture of uh, space versus frequency uh, to illustrate a couple other manipulations we can do of our RF pulse, including the gradient. We have our RF pulse, you know, create some selective flip angle as a function of frequency. Then we apply our imaging gradient. We're going to do this mapping. Like so, which says, okay, we'll get a, a certain flip angle uh, over a small region in space. So we'll get our slice excitation. Perfect, this is exactly what we want. Now, what happens if we do a manipulation of say the gradient amplitude, let's say let's decrease the gradient amplitude here. How does this change this picture? And the general relationship that we have in this picture is that the frequency is going to be our gyromagnetic ratio, gamma bar, times whatever the Z gradient amplitude is, times our position in space. Um, Okay, so in the uh, in the limit of say we have uh, zero gradient uh, that we applied 
that means the frequency is the same for all position. And so actually this manipulation has this effect, this picture. So now you can draw these connecting lines down here and see that, okay, what's gonna happen in this case is we're going to excite a much thicker slice when we reduce the magnetic field gradient. Of course, you could also um, drive this by looking at the relationship between uh, slice profile thickness and uh, position. It was on the last slide as well. Let's add Another manipulation in here as well. So let's go back. We're going to apply our magnetic field gradient. And we're going to have our selective RF pulse. Okay, we're going to have our nominal behavior that is going to excite a slice. in Z, like so. And for the purposes of this question, let's say we have an RF pulse shape that we denote by this function B1 of T. And uh, what if we make this change, which is a little tricky to draw, but where we keep the same envelope of our RF pulse, but we actually add in some modulation of this shape. What I mean, what I want to do here is I want to take the original shape and I want to multiply it by A complex exponential. Uh, create this frequency modulation on top of this shape. And here we could actually use one of our Fourier transform pairs that says, well, if we have um, our function in time multiplied by a complex exponential when you take the Fourier transform we're going to get the Fourier transform of whatever our original function was shifted simply by whatever the frequency is of this complex exponential. Okay, so the net effect of this change of multiplying by a complex exponential of our RF pulse shape has the effect of shifting the, ra the range of frequencies that are being excited by our RF pulse and with the same magnetic field gradient, this has the effect of shifting the location of our <clears throat> RF pulse uh, location as well. And you can in fact use the relationship between the magnetic field gradient and position to determine that, well, this shifted location is simply um, the shifted frequency divided by gyromagnetic ratio times the gradient amplitude.
Okay, this becomes very important because we don't want to just excite our slice at uh, what is in this picture is the isocenter. We want to do a set a bunch of slices. So this we're going to be routinely doing this type of uh, what is called frequency uh, modulation. So this is called a frequency modulation. And this is going to uh, have the effect, a desirable effect, of moving our slice position. Okay, and one final example here. What if we take our original pulse shape? And we manipulate the pulse uh, bandwidth. And this picture, quickly sketching this since you've seen this a few times. <clears throat> and recall that this value here is our bandwidth. Okay, say uh, in this case we go to, and if we actually uh, compress, let's do like compress and scale our RF pulse. This is like the previous example where compressing the RF pulse in time will broaden. So compressing in one domain or shrinking in one domain has expansion in the other domain. So it's going to, it says the effect of creating a larger bandwidth, which then directly leads to a thicker slice. Okay, so I really like this intuitive picture using it here several times because I think it's helpful to um, go through a number of the different manipulations we can do of our RF pulses. Okay, back to this picture showed at the beginning. 3D volume is basically a case where we're not doing any sort of slice selection. The slab and the 2D sections are multi-slice is where, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we wanna add on some slice, some sort of slice selection. And what we know now is we could do it with these types of RF pulses. So over here for the 3D volume, uh, since we don't care about any sort of slice selection, we're not using gradients to change the magnetic field. We can just do uh, a hard RF pulse, it's gonna be fine. We can play it at you know, high amplitude. It'll be, it turns out it'll be the fastest RF pulse you can do. When we want to go to a 3D slab, which is usually a thicker region, and we're going to use imaging to, to create, um, to divide up the, the 3D slab into sub voxels, then we use a RF pulse, like a sink shape, but with a smaller slab slice selection gradient to do uh, only select a larger slab. And if we want to select more narrow regions, which are going to be our slices, then we're going to have to use a higher uh, gradient amplitude to select those uh, thinner slices. And then coming back to this picture, I've been showing these examples for GZ, but we can also be putting our slice selection gradients on the other axes to select for other uh, imaging orientations as well. Finally, the last point I want to make is that um, in reality, so this would be our ideal slice profiles or like perfect rect functions. Uh, in reality, they're not perfect rect functions. They have some shape to them. They have some tails. The edges are not perfectly flat. Uh, real pulses are a little better than this drawing, I would say. But um, and so, what happens when we're doing these 
we're shifting the frequency, so represented by these F1, F2. This is uh, the concept we just illustrated of shifting the center frequency. When we shift this center frequency um, to create these different slices at different locations, we can get this phenomenon of crosstalk and with the, with our realistic or imperfect slice profiles uh, is that we can actually um, create some flip angle uh, in the adjacent slice from a, from a, um, one of the other slices. Um, and so for this reason, sometimes we'll have a little bit of gap between these slices to minimize this effect. Okay, that concludes the lecture for this chapter on slice selection. So really we're driving at this single question of how do we excite a single slice with an RF pulse. Today you should have an understanding of why are we choosing these sync shaped RF pulses? Um, how do we choose our gradient amplitudes? And then how can we manipulate other properties of the slice like the thickness, uh, the slice location, uh, and the flip angle. Okay, thank you for watching.